Jeffrey Villa Hardware. Welcome to part 5 of the Kingdom of Sweden campaign. Last time we were left at the event of a war breaking out between Sweden and the Protestant Union. Why is that so? You may remember that we have purchased several provinces from the Protestant Union and others were passed to us that had small towns controlled by the Protestant Union. Now when the provinces are passed over, the main city is passed over but not the small towns. However, the small towns are important for quartering your army so that you get free upkeep for up to five units. There is no mechanic in this mode of buying those uh, small towns from the faction from which the main city was purchased. The only way to do this was to declare war, in this case against the Protestant Union. Now that is a tricky thing because you may get free upkeep in those towns, but you may lose allies in addition to the Protestant Union. And even if you gain back the allies, the Protestant Union may remain forever upset at you and ever again provide subsidies to the Swedish army. So there is some risk, but considering that the relations with all factions evolved were perfect when this happened, alliances could be made quickly once the relations with the Protestant Union are patched up. And this is exactly the idea behind this. Indeed, Saxony was one of the factions that broke their alliances with Sweden, as did the County Palatine of the Rhine, as did also the Margraviate of baden dolach as did also the Landgraviate of Hessen, as did also the Principality of Bayreuth. All of them dissolved their alliances and our relations with the Protestant Union, of course, became very poor and eventually, after taking those small towns, their relations became abysmal. Nonetheless, an offer was made after that for a ceasefire. And in fact, we asked for a tribute and uh, the Protestant Union agreed and hostilities ceased after which relations became reasonable with the Protestant Union and even an alliance was possible. So now you can see how all those small towns that were previously belonged to the Protestant Union, such as for example Pritzer, Pritzvik there, uh, Neuwopen, uh, Wittstock at the bottom of the map uh, actually, no, we open. No, we left that on purpose so we can have a contact with the Protestant Union with our diplomats. But other ones like uh, uh, Greitzwald and Demen and Ukeamunde and some of them uh, further in uh, eastern Pomerania here, like uh, Tracto and Stargard by Stettin and uh, several others, have now. Uh, become Swedish and they have Swedish garrisons which is going to massively help reduce our upkeep expenses and let's have a look at the diplomacy situation we have still kept eight allies France Protestant Union relations with the Protestant Union were reasonable and a few others with which relations were Perfect. Some unpaid mercenaries of the Protestant Union clearly were not happy and uh, they were causing trouble. We went to battle against them and they were defeated with hardly any casualties. Such results were occasionally possible even in a real war. Simply armies that were led by poor leaders just dissolved when battle started. And uh, 
general that bore that battle is now cruel and cunning. Yons of Baradeburg Kustrin. And they were defeated with hardly any casualties. Such results were occasionally possible even in a real war. The Polish rebellions near Desha continue the Poles are clearly disaffected by the presence of the Swedes. In Poland, Captain Max uh, is defeated by Karl von Taupadl, one of the generals recruited by Gustav Adolf in Desha. He was another clear victory and Karl von Taupadl increases in loyalty he will become the governor of Stettin. Now the battle between Johannes Perhoiter near Königsberg against more rebels under Captain Ulrich this time. The battle is won again easily. At this time, in March of 1626, the historical Battle of Dessau Bridge took place in which Wallenstein defeated the Protestant forces very handily. Our relations with uh, our former Protestant allies are improving. The Ottomans can invade the Old Swiss Confederacy. There is a spare of banking activity. Banks are being built everywhere. The bankers are capitalizing on uh, the high inflation with high interest rates. Only good events for our characters, including our heir, Carl Philip. We are now at game 10 100 in the April of 1626. And um, we obtain military access from the Protestant Union, which could be potentially of some importance later in the campaign. Our uh, relations with uh, allies are perfect and we succeed in gaining back an alliance with Saxony. Uh, our relations with Saxony are again back up to outstanding and uh, the diplomat who achieved that is now a master of diplomacy. In East Prussia, the Poles put under siege one of the smaller towns defended by a certain Captain Nicholas. Reinhold Anwep comes to the relief of the garrison. He uh, deploys his force into Spanish territories as the Poles have, as usual, brought a lot of cavalry. And here the Polish musketeers fire a volley and then some swordsmen charge the Swedish territories. The uh, pikemen move forward, the two sides get locked in melee. And the Polish shock cavalry are forced to retreat. The Greifenreiter. And uh, here are the Swedish lines, perhaps, you may feel these images are familiar if you have seen my signature. So another charge now by the Poles with cavalry. Look how fast they're riding, charging our lines. And they impale themselves against our pikemen who are holding fast. And behind the cavalry comes some enemy halberdiers who join their cavalry in the melee. Our pikemen move forward. Medieval two total wars, that's a brilliant game. Here's an image you may recognize from my recent signature. And so the beautiful fort and the background and our pikemen holding the ground, the enemy changes their mind, they retreat, their general is slain, the Sideratus, the Henning, the Atar, the Frenchman and Polish service and another and in general has fallen the battle ends in a draw but the enemy is absolutely destroyed 
back in Englau, the, the face of between Wallenstein and uh, Gabor Bethlehem continues. Or gain back our alliance with the Principality of Transylvania that uh, had been tattered after that affair with the Protestant Union. And our local diplomat becomes a master of diplomacy. We also gain back our alliance with the Palatinate of the Rhine and eventually also with the Landgraviate of Hesse. And so we're still in third position. The uh, Catholic League and the Austrians are on the top two positions. And here now again our allies, 13 allies, compared with only four allies of Bavaria. Poland has only one ally, the Old Swiss Confederacy has two, you know, Utrecht only one, Catholic League has only four allies. And uh, Stefan Fadinger led uh, a peasant rebellion at this time, and this is an event that uh, commemorates that it is part of the campaign. Something seems to have gone amiss between the Protestant Union and the Principality of Bayreuth. While a war is declared between the Protestant Union and the Dutch of Bavaria, relations are improved with the Principality of Bayreuth. While we gain back our alliance with the Duchy of Prussia and Electorate of Brandenburg. It is May of 1626, Sweden remains in third position at 61% the strength of Austria. And we gain back our last former ally we had lost during the affair with the Prussian Union, the Landgraviate of Hesse. And our relations now with the Landgraviate of Hesse are outstanding. And being in perfect relations with the Protestant Union, we start again our dealing. They offer us a small subsidy to attack the Catholic League. And uh, the face of between the Transylvanians and Wallenstein uh, as Heidlau continues. Uh, there's also the, the Margraviate of Baden Dola, I had forgotten about them, so they are now also back into our fold. And banks and other buildings continue to be built. We are doing well with their economy, 45,000 florins income, 45,000 golden. And the Prussians and the Austrians are facing each other outside Cottbus. Utrecht Union are doing well. They've gone into a counter-offensive against Spain and have taken Antwerpen from the Spanish as well as some of the smaller towns in the area. The Ottomans are besieging Udine, uh, which is being held by the Old Swiss Confederacy. This explains the event we saw earlier that the two are at war with each other. And here's an event that commemorates the siege of Breda that the Spanish won during the actual war. More buildings. The Battle of Luther also took place at around this time, which Count Tilly defeated the Protestants. It was another victory for the Catholics. Building and recruitment and training go on in preparation for the attack against Austria. The strength of Sweden is now about two-thirds of that of Austria, and a great battle takes place between uh, the Poles and our two greatest generals, Gustav Adolf, aided by Johann Bernheer. And uh, here are our two great generals at the top of the list, full of stars, and Gustav Adolf appropriately for Halloween, full of skulls. Johann Bernheer arrives with his reinforcements, and here's the Swedish army arrayed by Gustav Adolf and the Swedish formation. A very beautiful formation, perhaps the most beautiful military formation of all time. And a very successful one. We also tested it in tests, and turned out that even in tests for this game, it is one of the best formations, performing the best against the AI. Um, 
so the main um, uh, activity at this time from the side of the Poles were the sending of dragoons forward and a little bit of cavalry to skirmish. Now that's a silly thing. Uh, they sending their skirmishes forward, leaving the main army behind. But you must not forget that they're only being laid by a mere captain, and the AI takes account of that. So what general commands the AI army has an effect on how well the army fights. So here are Hakebusius on the left skirmishing against uh, two uh, companies of uh, Polish dragoons. The key here is not to let the dragoons deploy, just as in real history. So the um, Hakebusius are skirmishing against them, forcing the dragoons to take on to their horses. While they're on their horses, as they're being armed with muskets, they cannot fire their muskets. Good tidings. The enemy general lies dead. We've sent the base cur to hell. So that's the idea. So indeed, they don't fire anything because they're moving. In fact, they would say there are no horses, but they're actually behaving in a correct way. While the dragoons were skirmishing, their captain, uh, Oban, was also skirmishing very near our lines and he was shot dead and that caused the dragoons to break. Finally, the uh, enemy cavalry has decided to uh, move forward too late to save their captain or the dragoons. The enemy cavalry has concentrated their attack on our left. The dragoons there have come under a lot of pressure. However, the enemy cavalry has been fired at from the Hakabuzias on their side and they have become disorganized. Hamid lost their leader and most of the Polish cavalry is finally routed. So here is the center of our defense line and just let's take a look at this. The cohesion of the Swedish army compared with the uh, disorganized way the Poles are attacking having lost their leader. So the Poles are on the left, there are various units trying to attack our lines. Here you can see some of the Polish units again, if we take a break, they are coming towards the, uh, the Swedish lines. In the meantime, these units at the flank have been uh, uh, cut down by a cavalry. And our pikemen are marching forward, the units in the center are coming under fire from our artillery, they are being fired by a grape shot. The cavalry on the side is charging. Some units are randomly moving here and there. Here, they are uh, try hand uh, being attacked by our cursiers and they've been routed. More units have been routed on the left. Here, so this is a beautiful scene of that battle with uh, a push of pikes and uh, our uh, king is uh, coming to support the uh, pikemen against their pikemen, our pikemen against their pikemen, this glorious push of pikes. The enemy pikemen also fired at by our musketeers and by artillery, which is firing grape shot. And look at this glorious, glorious battle, this glorious push of pikes, this chaotic push of pikes between the Polish pikemen and the Swedish pikemen. And this is how beautiful this game, Medieval 2, is. A glorious game. It's, you know, it's the best past, present and future. It's impossible to make a better game. The modability, it's sky high. This game is out of sight. This was the major battle of this part 5 of the campaign. But we're not over yet. There's a lot more. Our units are reforming their lines just in case some units come back. They're reforming the Swedish formation, but the enemy is totally routed. All of Christendom will be awed by the victory we have won here today. A glorious victory for Gustav Adolf and Johann Banner. They've only lost a tenth of their force while the enemy was completely destroyed. The Swedish cavalry excelled in this battle. Uh, Gustav Adolf killed about 170, Johann Banner over 200. Hundreds of prisoners were collected. They were offered for ransom, but they were not uh, ransomed. They were presumably pressed into service into all armies. 
uh, King Gustav Adolf is now a, um, a great commander. Of course, he was always a great commander. He has four stars. Four stars extra. Don't add anything. He already has four stars. Gustav Adolf and Johann Bernay attack some more rebels near Dirschau. Another beautiful battle and in pleasant weather. The enemy is outmatched. And will be easily defeated. But the weather and the atmosphere are really very nice. Generals are collecting prisoners. Another victory for the Gustav Adolf. As I already said, enemy regiments sometimes dissolved in seconds or in minutes during a battle when they lost their captain if they were badly led and so on. So here, this battle was won with just three casualties. Gustav Adolf collected 200 prisoners just by himself. And here's a very important event. The Duchy of Brunswick is laying siege on Wurzburg and uh, as you will shortly see, this had enormous consequences for the campaign. During the actual war at this time, there were landings of the Swedes on the Polish coast. And if you click on the green tick button, you'll find out where those landings were in uh, the coast of Prussia and Poland. So here is one of them, uh, one of the units landing in Elbing. More units were landing around just to the north of Königsberg at the time around here in East Prussia. These uh, were researched by Monty and uh, Gigantus made uh, that a reality as part of the mod. This mod would be nothing without them. They wouldn't even have started doing this mod. They've done an amazing work. There was an issue with pyroid, but they have finally become our allies. The Catholic uh, League is still holding some uh, towns around Passau and Linz. They have defeated Stefan Fadinger, if you remember, he had uh, started a rebellion, a peasant rebellion in the area. Hesse is controlling a southern book, the Palatinate have taken Frankfurt. And here is that siege of Würzburg by the Duchy of Brunswick. It is October of 1626, winter is setting in. Sweden is third overall. Our merchants are doing well, as are all our agents. There's still a face off of the Transylvanians and Palestine and people now. Nicodemus Aurevilius is wrangling an agreement with the Protestant Union. They agree to give us Sassanids in Mecklenburg uh, Pomerania. Another diplomat, Zygmunt Sven, offers an attack on the Catholic League to the Duke of Brunswick. Rome was one of the victory conditions, it is one of the islands that Denmark was controlling and our diplomats succeeded in obtaining Rome from Denmark, Norway. A general is adopted by one of our generals. He has an event on Baroque architecture introduced by Monti. There is an alliance now also between the Dutch of Brunswick and the Protestant Union and construction continues. We are at 42,000 gold and income, still third. One of our merchants acquires one of uh, our enemy merchants. The Turks are still besieging Udine, being held by the old Swiss Confederacy. 
still a face face off between Wallenstein and the Transylvanians. A Polish general pulled the attacker attacks Johann Bernier, who was in a small town south of Dershau. Georg Lindbergh, uh, Captain Kempsey's aid with the relief force. The enemy general Jan Stanislav Sepierka, who was in the enemy army, a real historical general, is slain. Paul the attacker also falls in the field of battle. He had the reinforcements, but Georg Lindbergh all was very quick. The artillery of Johann Bernier is firing at the enemy cavalry. Another beautiful battle, full of beautiful scenes. Here's a house that's been destroyed. There's some random enemy charges, enemy units retreating. And the battle is easily won with a loss of only 67 men. Some of the musketeer companies killed more than a hundred men, sometimes close to 200 each company. There are ongoing minor rebellions in the east. These rebels are easily defeated without casualties. One of our generals, Aurelius Solochenius, is happily married to Ulrika Eleonora Lochenius. Construction continues, all kinds of helpful buildings. We are third overall, two thirds of the strength of Austria. One of our generals, Bertrand Botnikar, laid siege to a Polish settlement, Cowen, in what is today Lithuania. The settlement is easily won at relatively low cost. Another siege, the siege of Gnezin, takes place in Poland. Gnezin has been infiltrated by spies, as you can see by the gate, open gate icon. And in the battle that ensues an uneven battle, the settlement is easily won without delay. The enemy was surprised at night. There was a night attack, and we only lost 62 men in taking the Nazim. And here's an excellent, excellent event. Our Swedish heir, Carl Philip, has enlisted a man called Johan Marquis, and this is the perfect man to lead Marquis' Scottish regiment. He will be immediately dispatched into Strasbourg to take control of his very own infamous Marquis regiment. That war between Denmark, Norway and Austria has been entirely uneventful and a, a ceasefire is signed. Forget the uh, Danish then, we continue our war preparations both in terms of building buildings and moving our armies ready for an attack on the Austrians and Kaiser. Our generals are busy getting good attributes. Here's a military situation. We're suddenly improving our military strength. And uh, here's a situation around Lübeck. It has been passed back onto the Austrians when the uh, Danish signed a peace with them. In Englau, Wallenstein is still busy with the Transylvanians. Lifting the fog of war reveals that Wallenstein has uh, amassed a massive army around Iglau to counter the Transylvanian threat, but obviously he is not suspecting our imminent attack uh, in the direction of Saxony, and one wonders how long is he going to take to march into Saxony to meet Gustav Adolf in battle. The Kingdom of France has made uh, an alliance with the Union of Utrecht. We continue building useful buildings and artillery arsenal in Dachau. And this is the annoying event that uh, I presaged earlier. You saw that siege of Würzburg. It must have been that the last remaining faction member of the Catholic League was in Würzburg. And here Würzburg is taken. And 
the uh, Catholic leader is no more. That was unfortunate in a way, and perhaps we ought to do something about faction members dying so easily while not being replaced. The Duchy of Brunswick now controls Würzburg. The Ottomans are marching again against Klagenfurt that the imperialists have taken back. Some of Wallenstein's men seem to have uh, gone off north. The Poles besiege a town near Dodge Corner. Relief comes in a timely way and the battle is easily won. Another small town is besieged by a Polish force at the same time simultaneously a very clever trick by the Poles. Relief arrives once again and the uh, siege is lifted, the enemy is defeated. Here's a glorious scene from that battle. These Yukas are our Yukas. The battle is very much in our favor. If we remain true and steadfast, victory will be ours. They charge again and again, annihilating their Polish companies. Here's another glorious charge. That unit of tankos has been completely wiped out with a single charge. And that battle was over again with minimal casualties, but not for our enemy who lost more than 3,000 men. Wasting no time celebrating for the battle, Reinhold Anweb attacks Captain Alexander at the head of a rebel regiment, which he routs with a loss of only six men. Following the demise of the Catholic League, Sweden is now second overall, and an event again introduced by Monty on Baroque music, which you can here in this mode on the strap map during the campaign. Very, very usefully, the Duchy of Brunswick has gone to war with the Imperial Archduchy of Austria, and we continue the build up of our forces in preparation for the war against the Kaiser. The end of this turn finds us second overall at 74% the strength of Austria. There is another battle against rebels. Karl von Taupadel is once again victorious. A clear victory at the loss of only a tenth of his men. Having defeated those rebels and having spotted another rebel army nearby, Karl von Taupadel goes straight away into the offensive and defeats that army too with a loss of only 56 men. What a brilliant young general, only 18 years old, but good to have him. And that is the end of this part 5 of the campaign. Thank you for watching. See you in part 6.